you know, very quickly and really quite small, write out all of the pathways. Okay. I won't put every little detail in, every little allosteric regulator. I can't get them all in on the board. But I'm going to jot everything down and kind of talk my way through it. And if you have a, so I'm going to write glycolysis hub reaction, the Krebs cycle, and then come over here to electron transport um, and ATP synthesis and the electron shuttles and then put in gluconeogenesis, put in uh, hexamonophosphate shunt, we'll do uh, glycogen metabolism, and then shoot off into the lipid pathways. So we'll be doing this kind of fast, and we'll have it up on the board. It'll be like the 10,000 foot view of, of what we've talked about so, forth, so far. And then, we'll, we'll try to get that done by, uh, it usually takes me right a half an hour to do that. But and then we're going to go through the questions for, especially for uh, the exam three of 2012. But by all means, ask questions as I go through this stuff. Okay? Ask questions. So, and, I, and I'm going to write it in shorthand. I'm going to write it in shorthand, but I'll talk you through it. So, we're first going to just look at starting with glucose and the pathways that come off that. And you know that for glycolysis, there's like three phases. There's phase one of glycolysis where you use ATP to destabilize the molecule, and uh, phase two where you split it into two, three carbon uh, pieces, and then finally uh, phase three where you generate some ATP and you end up with pyruvate. So the first step is, of course, making glucose 6-phosphate. That traps the glucose. Free glucose can go in and out of a cell via glutes and other membrane proteins. So this has trapped the glucose and it's also um, destabilized it. So we are going to use an ATP here. Now this is catalyzed by either hexokinase or glucokinase. And hexokinase basically found in all cells. Basically found in all cells. Glucokinase is restricted to the liver. So if you hear something about glucokinase, right off the bat, you know it's a liver question. You know it's a liver question. Okay? So these things are regulated differently. Uh, hexokinase does have end product inhibition. Glucose 6-phosphate uh, accumulation will inhibit it. Glucokinase is not inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate at all. There's no allosteric regulation. Uh, the presence of uh, insulin does cause glucose, or excuse me, glucokinase to be synthesized to a greater degree. Other thing about KMs, KMs. Hexokinase has a very low KM. Glucokinase has a high KM. So what's the relationship between KM and affinity? It's reciprocal, yeah. So hexokinase will trap glucose even when you have low concentrations of glucose. Glucokinase, you need to have a lot of glucose around, has a, you know, it has a much higher KM. That means it has a much lower affinity for glucose, so you don't get this reaction going on in hepatocytes unless you have a lot of glucose. Yes? So going back to regulation, you said that all was in and outs at the end of glycolysis steps 1, 3, and 10 have the, uh, are regulated by insulin and glucagon. Mm -hmm. So in this, in this, you just said that insulin um, affected glucokinase, but is it both insulin and glucagon affect both of the enzymes? No. Nope. No, no, no. So... So th this is this is this is insulin right here. That's insulin right there. I'm just confused because there's a slide that had plus minus plus minus for all yes. of those steps. Uh, there are some where it's just one and not the other. Now, are is are you talking about going over on the phosphatase side by any chance? Well, we'll talk about that. You find that, and we'll talk about that. Okay? Yeah, Kim. Did you say that G6B does nothing to inhibit 
glucose 6-phosphate does nothing to inhibit the function of glucokinase. It certainly it has end product innovation with hexokinase. That's right. Okay, the next uh, reaction is just changing it from the uh, aldose form to the keto form. So uh, it's just a simple isomerization reaction. Uh, fructose 6-phosphate, we convert glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. And then comes kind of a big, so that's this isomerization reaction, it's equilibrium, it goes both ways. Uh, glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, that is a one direction reaction. It is regulated, it, it's one direction. This next um, reaction that is catalyzed by phosphofructokinase, that is also a unidirectional, it's just a one direction uh, reaction and it's going to generate fructose 1,6 bisphosphate. Okay, this is typically the rate generating step of glycolysis, isn't it? So now this is the end of phase one glycolysis. We have a destabilized molecule and it's kind of easy to have this thing pop apart. And that's what the enzyme aldolase does. It will split this into dihydroxy acetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde phosphate. And glyceraldehyde phosphate is also called uh, triose phosphate isomer. Uh, no, 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 excuse me. I'm jumping to the enzyme here. Uh, gl uh, glycerol 3 phosphate. Now, this dihydroxy acetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde phosphate, they can go back and forth to one another. Now, in the cell, the vast majority of the triose at any given time is dihydroxy acetone phosphate, isn't it? More, more than 90%. But you can go back easily in that uh, triose uh, phosphoisomerase. And it actually comes by a lot of different names. Um, ah, this next step. So that's the second phase of glycolysis, splitting it from a six carbon molecule to a two carbon molecule, and yes, those are equilibrium reactions. This next reaction is really an interesting reaction. It's a, it's kind of a strange gut. You can directly utilize an inorganic phosphate to phosphorylate this compound. At the same time, this is an oxidation reaction. Glyceraldehyde phosphate is going to be oxidized to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. So that means we're going to generate some NADH. So when we go from glyceraldehyde phosphate to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, guess what? We're harvesting two high-energy electrons. Two high-energy electrons. For all these oxidation reduction reactions that we talk about, it's the movement of an electron pair every time. Every time. So, and that's actually an equilibrium reaction. Here we have what's called substrate level phosphorylation. Substrate level phosphorylation. We can use the energy of one of those uh, phosphoryl subunits on that bisphosphoglycerate and we can actually phosphorylate an ADP to an ATP and thereby we're going to generate 3-phosphoglycerate, three 3-phosphoglycerate. Three this is substrate level phosphorylation. That means conversion of a substrate in a reaction to its product leads to the generation of ATP. Contrast and compare substrate phosphorylation to oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation is down here in the electron transport chain when we get there. By movement of electrons, the electron transport leads to oxidative phosphorylation. So substrate level phosphorylation, oxidative phosphorylation, they are two different animals. So we'll, I'll try to remember to talk about that. Now there's a simple mutase enzyme that is going to allow you to go back and forth from 3-phosphoglycerate to 2 phospho glycerate need to do that for this next reaction and we're going to convert 2 phosphoglycerate to 
uh, phosphoenolpyruvate. Phosphoenolpyruvate. What's the enzyme that does that? Enolase. I agree. What's the big thing with enolase? It's inhibited by fluoride. Very important in the world of dentistry. Ma a matter of fact, last year um, during this exam uh, dissection, I said, man, I, that's asked so many times and it's on every board exam. I, everybody knows that I'm going to pull it out. And the students said, no, it must be in because it's so clinically relevant. I ended up putting it in again. So, anyway. so, and that too is a an equilibrium reaction. This next reaction going from phosphoenolpyruvate to pyruvate, it's one direction because it's highly regulated. It's uh, catalyzed by pyruvate kinase, and this is another. This is another substrate level phosphorylation. So if we just had glyceraldehyde um, phosphate go through here, we're going to generate one, two uh, ATPs. That kind of accounts for the two that utilize up here. And then what happens? That dihydroxyacetyl phosphate is converted to glyceraldehyde phosphate. And then those carbons go through. We're going to have a net of two. A net of two ATP from from, uh, from glycolysis here. Now, what you're going to do with pyruvate? It depends on what cell you're in and what's, what's the condition, what's going on with metabolism. We can just convert pyruvate to lactate using the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase. Lactate dehydrogenase. And really, what kind of... What, what kind of reaction is this? Going from pyruvate to lactate. What's going on? It's a reduction. It's a reduction. So that means pyruvate is going to gain a couple electrons and that will convert it to lactate. So, and not every cell does this, but let's say for a sec second we're talking about a red blood cell. A red blood cell does not have mitochondria, so this is all it can do to, for making ATP. Just go down to lactate and then the lactate leaves the cells, goes to the liver, and the liver can use it for gluconeogenesis. But, uh, so for this to keep going in a red blood cell, you, you have to get rid of the pyruvate and get rid of the lactate, and then this can just keep going. So, NADH is used to reduce pyruvate to lactate, so we generate an NAD plus, okay? So that can happen here. Um, if we're in a red blood cell, or let's say we have a metabolically very active tissue, such as muscles, muscles that are contracting faster than they can receive oxygen, you can stimulate energy production that's going on with the Krebs cycle and electron transport by um, an anaerobic glycolysis. Okay, so, Dr. Krebs. Yes. So, um, we have a slide that says uh, kinases move the phosphoryl group from an ATP and into it goes both ways. It goes both ways. And you know, in that recording, I said, when you see kinase, you know a phosphoryl group is moving. It might, and you know, it might be moving from ATP to a substrate. It might be moving from a substrate to an ADP. Doesn't matter. Because there's a whole bunch of them, when, but when you see kinase, when you see kinase, Billy, I'll get to you in a second. You don't need to break your arm. Uh, but when you see kinase, think of a number of things. Number one, you need magnesium or some other divalent uh, metal cation. Uh, you think of substrate closing, uh, but really you always think a phosphoryl subunit's going someplace, someplace. So. Yes, sometimes it's you're phosphorylating a substrate, sometimes you're taking it off of a substrate and putting it on to uh, an ADP. It's still kinase. Yeah, Billy? Uh, just going back to the first, the glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, you said glucose 6-phosphate only inhibits exokinase, is that correct? Is it safe to say that insulin will only speed up exokinase or won't have 
insulin does, as far as I know, insulin has no effect on hexokinase whatsoever. Yeah, because it's already going into the mass. Exactly. It has such a low KM. Uh, yeah, exactly. It, it doesn't have any effect that I know of. That I know of. Okay, so now I'm going to draw in. This is supposed to represent mitochondria, okay? So, pyruvate can cross, and really what this is, is this is the inner membrane, the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Pyruvate can easily go through the uh, outer membrane, a lot of things can, but for pyruvate to go through, doggone it, I've not left myself much room. Uh, there is this counter transport process where a hydroxyl group is going one direction and pyruvate is coming in this direction. But if pyruvate, there are proteins that allow it to cross this inner mitochondrial membrane. So, hey, we've got pyruvate in here right, right now. Pyruvate, how many carbons is it? Three. Three, that's right. So the first reaction we're going to talk about here is the hub or pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction where pyruvate is used to generate acetyl-CoA. This is the type of reaction here is called an oxidative decarboxylation. And the way you can remember this thing is just remember dot. The sequence of what happens here is first thing happens, you decarboxylate. A CO2 comes off. And then there's an oxidation. You're going to generate an NADH. So you're going to take two electrons from uh, pyruvate. And then you're going to transfer a, a CoA subunit to it. So they go from a three carbon pyruvate to a two carbon acetyl CoA. At this point, that acetyl CoA can be used for a number of things. What we're going to talk about right now is the Krebs cycle or the tricitric acid cycle or the citric acid cycle. And I have to say it every time that Krebs is, or excuse me, <laughs> citrate is Krebs starting substrate for mitochondrial oxidations. So, that acetyl-CoA can, it is fuel for the Krebs cycle, fuel for the Krebs cycle. And it can be used in a condensation reaction. It can condense with oxaloacetate. So oxaloacetate is how many carbons? It's four. Acetyl-CoA is two. So when they condense together, you've just made a six carbon citrate molecule. Six carbon citrate molecule, right? And the first reaction of, uh, well, the second reaction of the Krebs cycle is just going from citrate to isocitrate. That's just an isomerization, and it's uh, and conotase does that. So nothing real big happens uh, going from citrate to isocitrate. But going from isocitrate to alpha ketoglutarate, that is catalyzed by isocitrate dehydrogenase, dehydrogenase. Every time you see dehydrogenase, you know oxidation is taking place there. And something else is taking place here. Going from isocitrate to alpha ketoglutarate, isocitrate, six carbons. Alpha ketoglutarate, just five, just five. This, just like the hub reaction, is an oxidative decarboxylation. The CO2 comes off. And also, you generate an NADH. So that's an oxidative decarboxylation. You've taken off a CO2 and you've taken off two electrons. And you slap the electrons on the NAD plus to make NADH. Okay, very next. Um, and usually, usually that sets the pace of the reaction, doesn't it? That's usually the pace setting uh, reaction. Going from alpha ketoglutarate, this is succinyl CoA right here. That is another alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. This is another oxidative decarboxylation, CO2 plus 
NADH. It turns out that this enzyme is very, very close to that pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme. Very close. They both pyruvate dehydrogenase and the alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, they are absolute cousins. They're both these three uh, complex, uh, these, these complexes that have three big subunits, three big subunits. And the reaction for both of them is first decarboxylate, oxidize, and then transfer a CoA to the product. Okay? Now, what type of nutritive cofactors are necessary for these two enzymes? Can you think of any of them? Pardon me? Well, you know, and you know, this year I didn't tell you, oh, ask you to go, okay, this complex needs this, this, or that. But, for example, you know, lipoic acid is needed for these enzyme complexes. Riboflavin are needed for these complexes. And obviously, since you're using uh, NAD+, you know, niacin is, is playing a, a role here. And uh, the one that I guess I didn't talk about yet is uh, thiamine. So, you know, there's some nutritive cofactors that if you're deficient in any of those, these two reactions can be compromised. And we talked about uh, the thiamine deficiency, uh, that's called beriberi. If you live in a culture where you normally don't consume enough thiamine, you can have this loss of uh, neural function, and you have cardiac impairment, and uh, such people, you know, they, they have problems walking and so forth. And uh, also this is where mercury poisoning can, can impact as well, okay? For both of those enzymes, they're close cousins to one another. Okay, we have succinyl coa yes? So lactate Remember, this is this is bidirectional. It has one name, but when you can definitely and where they get the name right here is when you go from lactate to pyruvate. That's a dehydrogenase reaction. Yeah. But it's still it's a bi, it's a it's an equilibrium reaction. So you don't change its name just because it's going one direction and going that direction. But yeah, that's. But when you see dehydrogenase, you know it. Electrons are going somewhere. But it, and this is just one that you just have to know that pyruvate going to lactate. And think of it this way: with red blood cells, the way you'll always remember it. With red blood cells, you have to get to lactate, right? Well, you can use that NADH that you make up made up here to drive that reaction down there. So here we have an oxidation reaction going from substrate to product. Here we have a reduction going from substrate to uh, product. And that keeps it in redox balance. And that's the way I always remember it. I, I know that we're generating NADH, so that means if that's an oxidation, we have to have a reduction right there for that to stay in balance. That's, that's the way I always remember it. Okay, going from succinyl CoA, the succinate, something interesting happens. There's so, there's so much energy and going from the, uh, that substrate to that product, you can generate GTP, GTP. That is energetically equivalent to ATP. So that's like saying you've just generated an ATP. Oh man, now it's really good going in here. So, once we get to isocitrate, uh, boy, every reaction, something big's happening. Going from succinate to fumarate, something big happens. It's another oxidation. You oxidize succinate to fumarate, but in this case, the electron acceptor is not NAD+, it's FAD, FAD. So you're going to generate 
FADH2. So stuff's happening all the time. And I was hoping to get, oh man, we're not, not going. Anyway, the, going from fumarate to malate, not much is going on there. Water's going on, water's coming off. It's not really exciting. Going from malate to oxaloacetate, that is another oxidation and generating another NADH. So really, what's the Krebs cycle doing? You are ripping acetyl-CoA apart, tearing apart to harvest these electrons. You're tearing acetyl-CoA apart to harvest a pair of electrons here, a pair of electrons here, a pair of electrons here, a pair of electrons there. That's what you're doing. And hey, you get a GTP out of it as well. Good deal, good deal. What do we do with all of these electrons? Well, we send them over to the electron transport chain, and it's actually kind of tough to draw this thing in two dimensions. And, and so there's complex one, complex two. These are actually both up in the uh, inner mitochondrial membrane. There's a Q pool right here, complex three, complex four. So, all of these electrons that we've been harvesting along here, we can put them in here, and the bottom line is we're going to use the reaction due to those electrons to do something so we can make ATP. So we're eventually going to make ATP. So how do we do it? All of these NADHs, NADH, NADH, NADH. From the hub reaction, we have one NADH. From Krebs cycle, we have three NADHs, right? NADHs, mitochondrial NADHs, can deliver their electrons to this complex one of the electron transport chain, okay? And then the electrons can pass on through all these complexes. And something interesting happens when these electrons start winding their way in a very defined pathway, which you incidentally don't need to know, but those, these electrons wind through this electron transport chain, and they're finally those electrons are dumped onto uh, oxygen, and you create water, okay? And you go, oh, where's the hydrogen coming from? Well, it's, all, it's also there along with the electrons. But when these electrons pass through complex one, you excite complex one, and what do they do? That excitation of the electrons cause it to pump out a quanta, a small amount of protons. The electrons go to the Q pool, the electrons pass through complex three, it excites it, and it causes it to pump out a small handful of protons. The electrons pass on over here to complex four. What does it do? It activates it and it pumps out a few more protons. So when you deliver these um, electrons via NADH, mitochondrial NADH, you actually activate three pumping stations, one, three, and four of the electron transport chain. And what do you do with all those protons? They build up to generate a proton gradient so those protons can go into this thing right here. This is ATP synthase and what is protons coming in now down its gradient do? It causes you to pop off that newly formed ATP. And there's a translocase also in that membrane that you can pump an ATP out and bring in a new ADP that you can then phosphorylate. Now, the way this book uses the accounting method, uh, one mitochondrial a, uh, NADP, or NADH, excuse me, gives you three ATP. Okay, so we're going to get three ATP out of this. But we also generated an FADH2 here, didn't we? What do we do with that? It actually goes into a different point in the electron transport chain. 
those electrons, the FADH2 electrons, still a pair of electrons, go into uh, complex two. They don't excite complex one at all. They don't go through it. They go right to the cupule, then they go to three and four. When they go across three, it causes protons to be pumped. When it goes across four, it causes protons to be pumped. So it doesn't pump out as many protons, so it doesn't generate as many ATP. So mitochondrial FADH2 is going to give you two ATP. Do you kind of see why? Less pumping stations activated, you're going to activate, uh, you're going to release less ATP. Okay, so what about this cytosolic, what about this cytosolic NADH right here? You want to get that to the electron transport chain too. How do we get it inside here across this membrane? That NADH cannot cross the inner mitochondrial membrane. So there are two electron shuttles I told you you needed to know. The first one we'll talk about is the malate aspartate electron shuttle. It's found in high concentration in your liver and in your heart. And that's the one that I say, the way I remember it is just mog -taw. And, uh, you know, it just works for me. So, what the heck is mog -taw? Well. MOG is malate, oxaloacetate, glutamate, CA is alpha ketoglutarate aspartate. And it turns out there's a, there's a shuttle here that there, some of these molecules can cross the membrane, other ones can't. But this does not allow NADH to cross the membrane, but it does allow its electrons to cross the membrane. So, if you take oxaloacetate and you reduce it to malate, you have malate dehydrogenase. Once again, this is a bidirectional reaction, but malate dehydrogenase, you can go from malate to oxaloacetate like you saw in the Krebs cycle. And here in the cytosol, we have the same enzyme and its equilibrium and its actions. It'll go from oxaloacetate to malate. You've just unloaded, you've just unloaded the uh, electrons from NADH onto malate. There are proteins in the membrane that allow malate to cross. Malate can come across. And then malate is going to be oxidized to oxaloacetate here in the mitochondria. And what picks it up? Just like in the Krebs cycle, it's actually the same, same enzyme, same NADH pluses. It picks up NADH. And then that can go into complex one, okay? So, and then, you know, what's going on here? There's all these interactions. Uh, alpha ketoglutarate can go across the membrane. Aspartate can go across the membrane. It's transamination reactions. And glutamate can cross the membrane as well. Um, these things just recycle and go back and forth, back and forth. And, but the important thing is malate can come across carrying those NADH electrons. That's found in high concentration in the liver and also in uh, uh, cardiac muscle. In other tissues, including skeletal muscle, you have what's called the alpha-glycerol phosphate shuttle or the glycerol-3 phosphate uh, electron shuttle. And we've already seen dihydroxyacetone phosphate. That's right here. You can unload, let's just put this NADH that you created during uh, glycolysis, you can unload those electrons onto dihydroxyacetone phosphate. You just created glycerol 3 phosphate, glycerol 3 phosphate. And glycerol 3 phosphate is not the same thing as glycerol phosphate, not. You can then dump off these electrons into, it's called an enzymatically linked FAD, and where the heck is it? It's actually right here. There's an enzyme right here on complex two that these glycerol 3-phosphate electrons can combine with an FAD located right here on complex two. 
So now you have linked to that thing FADH2. And what does it do? It's going to donate those electrons right here to the Q pool. So you have this is, uh, you've probably heard about CoQ10 or uh, coenzyme 10. So here we have. So these electrons come in, they're delivered right here, and they go right to the Q pool. So, although you start with NADH here, it's actually entering into complex 2 right here. So, this pathway right here, the alpha glycerol phosphate uh, shuttle gives you 2 ATP, whereas the uh, malate aspartate gives you 3 ATP. So, with the complexes, this is, or what? I think you said you have two complexes in this. So, okay, so the, the malate aspartate electron shuttle brings the electrons into complex one, right? So you're going to activate complex one, complex three, complex four. You're going to get three ATPs out of it, right? Now the alpha glycerol phosphate shuttle, it's delivering into complex two. Although it's an NADH, it, it originated as an NADH, going to be transferred to this FADH2 down here, so it's going into complex 2. That doesn't pump, does it? So you only get two pumping stations. Yeah, Taylor. Well, there's already in NADH inside the mitochondria. Why just pick it up so you don't lose any ATP? It's where these things fit into the enzymes. Uh, glycerol 3 phosphate. It doesn't, it doesn't fit into anything other than that catalytic subunit right there. And that catalytic subunit happens to the catcher right there is FAD, H, you know, FAD. So although these are electrons coming in here, the only thing there to catch them is FAD because that's what the enzyme's set up for. So why it's set up that way? Why, you know, that seems like an inefficiency. I don't know why it's like that. Yeah, it's not why you, yeah. We'll talk about that sometime. How does it get across the membrane? This is what I'm saying, that you can't draw this in three dimensions, because if you're looking down on this, if you're looking down on that inner plasma membrane, here's complex one, here's complex two, here's three, and here's four. Looking down on it, one and two are both right at the surface of that membrane. This makes it look like it's, it's below the membrane. It's not. It's just that you're trying to draw it in two dimensions when it's really a three-dimensional. It's actually up here at the surface. So it doesn't have to cross it. It just binds to that complex that's at the surface. Are those shuttles always working, or is it just during flow energy? They're, they're always working. They're working 24-7. Yes. 20, all the time. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Just to clarify, so the only time we use the shuttles is with the NADHs and the FADHs from glycolysis. Otherwise, we're using them as glycolysis. So straight to the left. Exactly. This, the, only reason, the only reason that we use those shuttles are to get cytosolically produced electrons into the mitochondria for the electron tra transport chain. That's the only time you use them. Okay? Okay, so, um, now there are times, there are times that we have plenty of energy, we have plenty of energy, but maybe we need glucose, maybe we need glucose. So, it's kind of hard to see buried in here, but here's pyruvate. And here we have lactate. I keep somehow wiping it out. Let's talk for just a couple minutes about gluconeogenesis. Let's say this is the liver. It's taken up lactate from the bloodstream. Exercising skeletal muscle pumps out lactate. The liver brings in lactate. Lactate can be oxidized to pyruvate. It can come inside that inner mitochondrial membrane. And you know, the point is, 
You can't get from pyruvate to phosphoenol pyruvate. That's a one direction. That's unidirectional. Can't do it. Can't do it. So we need to somehow bypass this reaction. And what we can do is pyruvate can be carboxylated to form oxaloacetate. And any so, and it's done by pyruvate carboxylase. Pyruvate carboxylase. Pyruvate carboxylase will take this three carbon pyruvate and it's going to carboxylate it to form this four carbon oxaloacetate. When you hear the term carboxylase, what vitamin has to be involved? Biotin. Biotin. You need biotin. Why do you need biotin? What does it carry? It, it carries the CO2 that you're going to use for, for uh, carboxylation, which comes from bicarbonate. Bicarbonate. So we've now made a 4-carbon oxaloacetate. Unfortunately, oxaloacetate can't go across that inner mitochondrial membrane. What we can do, just what you saw right here, we can convert it to malate, convert it to malate, because malate we know can get across, so we can reduce oxaloacetate to malate. Malate comes across, very cool, and then out here in the cytosolic side, you can just oxidize that malate to oxaloacetate. And then we can convert oxaloacetate to phosphoenol pyruvate. So this is a four carbon molecule. How many carbons are on phosphoenol pyruvate? Three. So what has to happen? Decarboxylation. That's exactly right. So we know a CO2 is going to come off. The name of this enzyme is phosphoenol pyruvate carboxykinase. So yeah. There's the kinase, you know, a phos phosphate's going someplace. This actually, this phosphor, this is a decarboxylation phosphorylation reaction, and instead of using ATP, guess what? It requires GTP. It requires GTP. That's kind of a strange, strange one. So, all these reactions for glycolysis are reversible until you get to this phosphofructokinase catalyzed step. We need to have a different enzyme to get past that step, and that is uh, fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. So we go from fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. We remove a phosphoryl subunit. So when you take off that pho uh, phosphate, it's a, that's by a phosphatase. And we have to do the same thing going from glucose 6-phosphate to glucose. We need glucose 6-phosphatase. What cells have glucose 6-phosphatase? liver and the kidney. It's actually the renal cortex of the kidney. And where is glucose 6-phosphatase located in the cell? In the endoplasmic reticulum. That's exactly right. So, this is, I want you to think about this. We start with, let's say we start with two lactates. We start with two lactates. We start out here in the cytosol, we convert to pyruvate. We have to bypass this reaction. We go into the mitochondria, so we went from the cytosol to the mitochondria, out of the mitochondria, back to the cytosol, endoplasmic reticulum, back to the cytosol with free glucose. So we're doing a lot of compartment shifting, aren't we? Yeah. Do you know what fructose 2,6 Yeah, fructose 2,6 bisphosphate. This, this year, well, actually for the last couple of years, um, I said, you know, I'm going to really not talk much about it. Fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is whenever a cell generates it, that is a signal of high glucose. So you only see 
fructose 2,6-bisphosphate when you have high cellular glucose. And in medical biochem, there's a reason why you talk about it here. It's not that important. In the last two weeks of physiology, there's one thing we'll talk about it. And, uh, and it, so we'll talk about, about one thing. So I want you to think, what if, what if we had, you know, what are some other substrates for gluconeogenesis? Uh, Taylor, yeah. Yes. Ah, good point. Pyruvate carboxylase is only in the mitochondria. So, for you to use, let me, let, let me just mention this, you know, you know that you can go from alanine to pyruvate, all you have to do is take off an amino group, that's it. So if you start with cytosolic alanine, you have to put that pyruvate in here to get past that because, just what you said, pyruvate carboxylase is only in the mitochondria. You have to go down. You have to go down there. It is restricted to the mitochondria. So, do you have gluconeogenesis in red blood cells? Uh-uh. You don't have this. You don't have that. What about, now you've already seen that you go from glycerol 3-phosphate to dihydroxyacetone phosphate. The liver can also take up glycerol. The liver has what's called glycerol kinase, and that will uh, generate glycerol 3 phosphate. So, guess what? We can take in glycerol that's coming in via the bloodstream, and we can convert it to dihydroxyacetone phosphate. It's mighty simple. It's mighty simple. Um, and yeah, okay. So that's you can oxidize glycer, uh, glycerol three phosphate to dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Guess what? Okay, you. Everybody, kind of pay attention here, okay? Because I asked this for a essay question two, three, four years ago. I had two glycerols coming in. Glycerols, how many carbons? Three. So we need to have two glycerols to make one six carbon glucose, right? A whole bunch of people in class, 20% of the class, brought in glycerol, went down to pyruvate, went in, came back out, went back up here, and then went to glucose at least 20% of the class. Think about that. If you go that direction, you, you pass through these molecules both times, don't you? The body's much more logical than those 20%. <laughs> what it does is it just goes up like that. Just like that. So do you need the mitochondria? Mitoc do you need pyruvate carboxylase uh, when you're starting with glycerol? So does it still convert from the DHAP to the GAP or does it just go up to the fructose one six? Yeah, yeah. Because what's going to happen is uh, one of those glycerols are going to be converted to glycerol, uh, glyceraldehyde phosphate. One's going to be converted and stay as uh, dihydroxyacetone phosphate. They'll condense. They will form fructose one six bisphosphate. Okay. Exactly. So that's split. Okay. So, um, man, oh man, I'm sorry about this. Uh, we probably won't go through all the exam, but we're going through all the material. Uh, another offshoot off of all of this is the hexyl monophosphate shunt. And I said you don't need to know all the intermediates and all the enzymes. You do need to know that first step and that third step, what's going on here is we're going to, uh, this enzyme right here, and it's the most common genetic enzymatic deficiency in humans is uh, what we're going to be going here to is ribulose 5-phosphate, okay? This is glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. 
glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. It's an oxidation reaction, but what's the electron acceptor? NAD plus. So you're going to generate NADH. Okay? And you're going to have another oxidation over here. Plus, that's a 6-carbon molecule. Ribose is a 5-carbon molecule. So, not too surprising, you also kick off a CO2 there. That's the oxidative phase of the hexyl monophosphate shown. And then you can use this uh, ribulose 5-phosphate to make ribose 5-phosphate. Right? Now, what if, and you can use that ribose for DNA, RNA, for CoA, for NADA, FAD, uh, all those require ribose. Now, what if you just really needed the NADPH, but you don't need the ribose? Well, you don't just throw it away. You can bring it back into glycolysis by a whole series of transketolase and transautolase reactions. And it's and they're very, oh my gosh, they're, they're highly involved. But the point is, you're going to bring those carbons back in at the level of fructose 6-phosphate and glyceraldehyde phosphate. So the bottom line is if you have three riboses, you're actually going to generate two fructose 6-phosphates and one glyceraldehyde phosphate, 15 carbons, 15 carbons. These are bidirectional. The non-oxidative phase is bidirectional. So if you just need ribose but you don't need, need NADPH, you can just create it going this direction, just the bottom only, just the non-oxidative phase only. Uh, there's a transketolase in there that requires thiamine. So if you're thiamine deficient, this doesn't work well. What does the TDA represent under the TDA? Transaldolases and transketolases. <coughs> This is glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. G6PDH. This glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase is, is the name of that guy. Okay? Okay, so um, I'm not going to talk about glycogen right, right here because I really want to get over to something that's what we've been talking a lot about lately, and that's the lipids. If you have eaten or drank a whole lot of glucose, you're probably going to easily meet your energy demand. You're going to have as much ATP as you need. But the body doesn't want to waste things. It'll take some of those glucose carbons and start making them into fat so it can be stored to utilize later. How do we, and all of the lipids, really come from acetyl-CoA? You make acetyl-CoA inside the mitochondria. How do you get those acetyl-CoA carbons out into the cytosol? Because all of those lipid anabolic reactions are actually in the cytosol. How do you get that acetyl-CoA out? Well, it's actually by something called the citrate uh, shuttle or the citrate cycle. I think cycle is actually more um, correct. But no big surprise. If you're making a lot of acetyl-CoA, you're going to be making a lot of citrate, right? So as C uh, citrate builds up, citrate can cross that inner mitochondrial membrane. That's fine. So now we have citrate out here in the cytosol and we do have something called ATP-dependent citrate lyase that what will it do? It'll, and it takes ATP, this, this requires energy to do this. It'll break that acetyl-CoA off away from the citrate and we're left with oxaloacetate. It's just the reverse of that first reaction in the Krebs cycle, except here, 
You need ADP, ATP. We can then convert oxaloacetate to malate. You've seen this several times already. It's a reduction reaction. And finally, in this cycle, now you go, well, malate can just go into the, across that uh, inner mitochondrial membrane. Yeah, it can. But it can also do this next step because you get something else out of it. You have malic enzyme that will convert that malate to pyruvate. And uh, like Roy pointed out, hey, that's, that's going to require a decarboxylation, and that's absolutely right. But what do you get out of that reaction? You generate more NADPH, more NADPH. And you use that for reducing power for synthesis. Pyruvate, you already know, it can cross that uh, inner mitochondrial membrane. And... Uh, Quite honestly, I can write all this stuff out in 15 minutes when I don't talk it out to people. So uh, we go from malate, or excuse me, we go from pyruvate and we bring in, uh, here's pyruvate carboxylase, pyruvate carboxylase, we saw it already for gluconeogenesis. We use it again here. We convert pyruvate to oxaloacetate, a three carbon molecule, to a four carbon molecule. And then from that point on, you can just keep bringing in the acetyl CoA. You bring in acetyl CoA and you just keep this thing spinning. So acetyl CoA is going in here, acetyl CoA is popping out there. And what can you use that acetyl-CoA for? You can take acetyl-CoA and using acetyl-CoA carboxylase, acetyl-CoA carboxylase, you can make malonyl-CoA, can't you? This is a two carbon molecule. This is a three carbon molecule. So that is acetyl-CoA carboxylase. What, what vitamin would be required? Biotin. Yeah. Are you in the mitochondria matrix still? Nope. We've left the mitochondria. The whole, yeah, thanks, thank you. The whole point of the citrate shuttle is to get these acetyl-CoA carbons out of the matrix of the mitochondria and into the cytosol. Okay. That's the whole reason for it. Everybody cool with that now? Yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. So, we can then, from malonyl CoA, now I'm going to do this pretty quickly so you stop and ask me questions. So we now have malonyl CoA, we have acetyl CoA out here in the cytosol. We can change those CoAs to a different carrier molecule called ACP. And those are very important for um, fatty acid synthesis. So let's talk about, we've had a lot of glucose. We're generating a lot of excess acetyl-CoA. Let's store it away in a fatty acid. Let's store it away in a fatty acid. First step is making malonyl-CoA <laughs> that you use to generate this malonyl ACP. And at this point, stuff's going to happen. We take an acetyl ACP. We're going to condense it with that malonyl ACP. So this is a condensation. So we condense malonyl CoA with a uh, acetyl uh, ACP, and we kick off the CO2. So this is two carbons, this is three carbons, we're going to generate a four carbon molecule right here. And then what are we going to do to it? We're going to reduce it using NADPH, 
we're going to dehydrate it. We're going to get the water out. When you make a fatty acid, you want to get the water out. And then we're going to reduce it again. So we have a condensation, a reduction, a dehydration, and then another reduction. So we, what we have right now, we have a four carbon fatty acid. And if we want to get a six carbon fatty acid, what do we do? We just come in here and we repeat it. We bring in a brand new malonyl ACP and go condensation, reduction, dehydration, reduction. We're up to six. Do it again. Condensation, reduction, dehydration, reduction. We're up to eight. And we keep this up, and how big of a fatty acid do we make? 16. A 16 carbon pound palmitate. So what we've just done is we've just made fatty acids. That this is called de novo fatty acid synthesis. Questions on de novo fatty acid synthesis? This one on peptide, you were saying this. Yeah. In eukaryotic cells, in eukaryotic cells, the uh, acetyl CoA carboxylase, the condensation uh, enzymes, the reduction enzymes, and there's a couple, the dehydration enzymes, and then the final measuring enzyme, thioesterase. They're all part of a single protein. There's at least seven enzymatic subunits on one protein. Now on bacteria, there's seven individual enzymes. Now, um, and that does bring me up to something called triclosan. Triclosan is a substance that inhibits one of these reduction steps, but it inhibits it only in bacterial systems. It doesn't inhibit it in eukaryotic systems. Are you, are you counting the seven? Are you counting that trans the, the thioesterase, yeah. No, the um, transacylase. Uh, oh, yes, the transacylase right. are part of that. Yeah, those are the ones that transfer from CoA to ACP. They're, they're part of that. Eukaryotic, uh, yeah, I, I didn't count those in there. So, so we've just made a fatty acid. We've just made a fatty acid. If we are going to store this away as triacylglycerol, we need to make an intermediate compound first. Anybody want to know? Anybody know what that intermediate compound? There's an intermediate compound that's used to both make triacylglycerol and also to make phospholipids. Oh, one person saying it. Second person. Ah, another one knows it too. So there's phosphatidase. What the heck is phosphatidase? Just think a glycerol backbone with a phosphate group on the number three carbon with two fatty acids of sterified to it. So we can make these fatty acids and we can make phosphatidate. And then all you have to do, it's pretty simple to just go over to triacylglycerol. We can also use phosphatidate to make the phospholipids. All we have to do is add inositol and we have phosphatidyl inositol. All we have to do is go from phos uh, phosphatidate is add Phos uh, serine to it, and we have phosphatidyl serine. From that, we can make phosphatidyl ethanolamine. From that, SAM comes in, and SAM bangs ethyl three times, and you get a phosphatidyl choline. The older name for phosphatidyl choline is lecithin. lecithin. This starting to come back to the surface a little bit? Yeah, right. Uh, back to uh, phosphatidate. Yes, phosphatidate. Yes. Okay. Um, you want us to know, I wrote a bunch of notes here, I want to make sure I got this right. You want us to know that uh, it's raw phosphate acyl? Acyl? Acyl transferase. I'm from the south. You want us to know that. Uh, 
Yeah, that's the only thing you need to know. And what and where that ER. where's that enzyme found? Oh, ER. ER. So so many, you know, if you're talking about the synthetic reactions for um, lipids, you can't go too far off by just remembering, oh, it's probably associated with the ER. Yeah. Pardon me? What enzyme? In the outer. No, it's on the surface. It's on the surface. So many of the uh, synthetic or um, to make triacyl glycerol, to make phosphatidate, uh, so many of those enzymes are found associated with the uh, endoplasmic reticulum on the surface. What was that enzyme? He was talking about the glycerol acyl transferase. Isn't that the one you were talking about? What page? 50 is one he's talking about. Okay. Now, and I am, and I am just very abbreviated. We can start condensing acetyl coas together. We can take three acetyl coas. And we can make uh, H M G Co A, and uh, this is actually the precursor for two different families of lipid molecules. We can use H M G Co A to make mevalonate, and this can be used to make. And so this is uh, this is six carbons. We can use it to make isopentyl pyrophosphate. That's five carbons. You actually condense three of those things together, uh, two of those things together, and you're going to make geranyl pyrophosphate, ten carbons. You're going to bring in another one of these isopentyl pyrophosphates. You make uh, farnesyl pyrophosphate. That's fifteen carbons. So it takes a lot of ATP to make those guys. You put two of these 15 carbon farnesyl pyrophosphates together, and you get this uncycled monstrosity called squalene. That's 30 carbons. You cyclize it, and that's called lanosterol. You get off three, and that's 30 carbons. You take off three carbons in a very specific way. It's only 19 steps, and you get cholesterol which is 27 carbons. Uh, this part right here takes NADPH. What is that L molecule under squalene? Uh, under squalene, lanosterol. <coughs> lanosterol. It's the cyclized 30 carbon f version. Which step takes NADPH? Uh, you'll, you'll see that it's a couple of different steps. When you're making squalene, it takes NADPH. When you are cyclizing lanosterol, it's taking NADPH. So, but I want you to understand, it takes a lot of ATP up front. It takes some reducing power on the end here. And you're going to get cholesterol. From cholesterol, what can you make? Steroid hormones, vitamin D. You can make bile. What are the steroid hormones? What I want you to know at this point is, yeah, I hope you know cortisol, I hope you know aldosterone, I hope you know uh, progesterone, estrogen, and testosterone. We're not going to worry about the, uh, yeah, well, that's actually the synthetic portion. That's it. What do you mean, that's it? It took us an hour and five minutes. How long do we get for the test? It's an hour and a half. It's an hour and a half. <laughs> so not enough time to write it. Uh, yeah, like, uh, seriously, yeah, please do practice, practice, practice writing shorthand pathways. I, honest to goodness, can write this out in 12 minutes. Okay, so you and think it's worth it? I, yeah, absolutely. It is more than worth it. And what I would suggest for you to do is don't put it on the back page of the last page. You're going to be handing that in probably. Put it on to the next to last page on the back, okay? Because... Uh, I'll be with you in just a second, uh, is, you know, 
these exams I only print on one side. So from this point on out in the semester, as soon as you get your exam, I, for, in years past, what people do is they flip it over and they sketch out pathways as quickly as they can in maybe 10 minutes, and then you just answer questions off of that. Okay. It's usually worth your time, and I can guarantee you that if you develop the ability to do that, not just closing your eyes and seeing it, but writing it out, when it comes to the final and being able to do that, big help. Big help. Yes. Um, can we take the we're going to be taking the test in uh, Dixon, right? Yes. Can we take it in the lab? Because nope. that will give us a lot nope. of space. Nope. 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 People write stuff down. Oh. And it runs into a problem. And who gets pissed off? The students. The faculty. They did what? But uh, it's the students who get very, very excited and upset. So, no, we shall never take another exam in there. Just one thing. Yeah. A little, a little afraid to ask is, no. What is the other thing you need to do for the next? Uh, oh! <laughs> Ketone bodies! And there's three of which you need to know acetoacetate. And I just put KB, ketone bodies, acetoacetate, acetone, and 3-hydroxybutyrate. Can you say that one more time? Yep. Acetoacetate, acetone, and 3-hydroxybutyrate. It was just what we ended up with today, but you know, we didn't talk about synthesizing. This just so you know where it comes from. Oh, and hey, guess what? Um, where do statins work? HMG CoA reductase. This very this step right here. This step right here is the rate generating step for all this for cholesterol, going from here to here. That's the rate limiting step for all that mass. Okay. And it takes a couple of NADPHs to do that. Okay? Okay, so I know you're spinning at this point. Let's grab that number three exam, and we're just going to be kind of talking through some of these things right now. So let's look at question number one. Humans do not have an enzyme to directly convert pyruvate to phospholenopyruvate. Okay? We can't go from here to there. That pyruvate kinase doesn't allow, right? <coughs> Therefore, bypass reactions are utilized to overcome this specific deficiency. Which enzymes below is are utilized to bypass this limitation? Okay. Pyruvate carboxylase. Pyruvate carboxylase is going from pyruvate to oxaloacetate. Does that help bypass that? A lot of heads are going up and down. Yes, that one does it and Pepsi-K does it. Use pyruvate carboxylase and Pepsi-K to bypass that. Okay, so we know A's right. Glucose 6-phosphatase, does that help bypass that? No. You need it for gluconeogenesis, but it's clear up here, right? So you don't use it. Uh, fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. You need it for full gluconeogenesis, but it doesn't help you with that bypass. So the only correct answer is A. All agree? Cool. Okay, when plasma glucose falls below 80, plasma glucose is falling below 80 in a normal healthy person, which of the following increase? Before we even get to the foils, just thinking when you're talking about glycemic control, you think of insulin, you think of glucagon, right? So when plasma glucose is elevated, what goes up? Insulin. What goes down? Glucagon. When your plasma glucose goes down, what goes up? Glucagon. What goes down? Insulin. Okay, so let's check this out. When plasma glucose falls below 80, which is the following increase? Insulin release. Does insulin release? No, it actually will go down. What would increase? You told me. Glucagon. Uh, hepatic glycogenolysis. Hepatic glycogenolysis. What is that? And I didn't draw it in here. Uh, 
it is breaking down hepatic glycogen. And I am going to put something in here right now, but for glycogen metabolism, you work through glucose 1-phosphate. You come off of glucose 6-phosphate, and to get up to glycogen, you use glycogen synthase, and to come back down, you use glycogen phosphorylase, but you're working through glucose 1-phosphate there. So, we know B is correct, but let's just for kicks and grins look at C. Uh, GLUT4 translocates to the plasma membrane. When does that occur? When insulin's high or when you're exercising that muscle? So C is an incorrect conversion of, aha, glycogen synthase from its B form to glycogen synthase in its A form. So is B form active or inactive? B is always inactive, A is active. So we're going from uh, gly inactive glycogen synthase to active gly glycogen synthase. You wouldn't want that to happen, would you? When plasma glucose is too low, you don't want to be making glycogen. You want to be saving your glucose for the bloodstream for your brain, right? While we're still here, because I want to hit the concepts even if we don't hit all the questions, um, what has to happen to glycogen synthase B to be converted to glycogen synthase A? Is it phosphorylated, dephosphorylated what? Dephosphorylated, that's exactly right. Glycogen synthase, when it is phosphorylated, that puts it in its B or inactive form. When you dephosphorylate it, it goes into its A or active form. Okay, cool. So B is the correct response. The alpha glycerol phosphate shuttle, boy oh boy, it's getting hard to see it, but it's right here. The alpha glycerol phosphate shuttle functionally links the blank to the electron transport chain. So, so the TCA cycle. Do we need that shuttle to get electrons from the TCA cycle to electron transport? No, of course not. The pentose phosphate pathway to the electron transport? No. From the glycolytic pathway to electron transport? Do you see why that is? We generated that NADH by the glycolytic pathway, didn't we? Okay. So C is the only correct answer. Everybody good, good with that? Okay. Uh, e, or four. The answer happens to be E, which I see in my notes here. Uh, which enzyme catalyzes a bidirectional equilibrium reaction? So, hexokinase. That's one direction, isn't it? First step right here. Glucokinase, right here, first step. Pyruvate kinase, that's actually step 10. And glycolysis, that's one direction only. Uh, phosphofructokinase, last step in phase one. It's unidirectional. No. It, Yes, yes, it is last step. So we better find one here. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. It's this one right here. So, you know, if it's not a controlled, uh, if it's not a highly regulated reaction, chances are it's bidirectional. So E is the only thing correct there. Okay, five. The complete metabolism of one glucose molecule to lactate in a red blood cell provides a net yield of 2 ATP. What do you think? I see a lot of heads going up and down. I agree with that. You use 2 ATP up here, you're going to get 4 down here, so you're going to get 2. Are you going to get 1 ribose? You know, going from glucose to lactate, there's no ribose in the middle of, of that. Uh, one lactate. Very good. I've seen people going two. There's a peace sign, or maybe a never mind. So usually the other sign's given to me. Just thinking to find one. Uh, but it's actually two, it's not one. So do you generate two NADHs? You generate just one, and it's right there. And then you utilize it right here, so there's a net of zero. Is it there? There's a net of zero because this is looking for the net yield. So A is the only one that's correct. Yes. Oh, 
Uh, yes, that's absolutely right. You, does this say? I get the net isn't, but you just said that. Yeah, you're going. You're going to make. You're going to make two here. You're going to utilize two here. Right. I'm. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. With each pass, it's going to be one one. But for for both, it's, it is. You're absolutely correct. The net is zero. The net is zero. Okay. Uh, six. Compared to type one diabetes, what's the problem with type one diabetes? Loss of beta cells, so they can't make insulin. And if you can't make insulin, what happens to your plasma glucagon? It goes up, that's right. So compared to type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes is more, so we're looking for mores, is more prevalent. You buy that? Yeah. Yeah, type 2 diabetes is 90% of the diabetes mellitus in this country. Uh, type 2 diabetes is more dependent on insulin therapy. Type 1 is. Type 1 diabetics have an absolute life-preserving requirement for insulin. Type 2, some people might need it. Uh, C, is closely associated with lifestyle. Type 2 is very closely associated with lifestyle. Uh, your body weight and also how much physical activity you have. So I'm looking at E. Most people are saying, yeah. Seven, packed by, backed by popular demand. I wasn't going to have it, but when we did a review last year, they said, Dr. Crouch, that's clinically relevant. I think it behooves you and us as <laughs> professionals uh, to have that again. I said, well, let me second that idea. You agree? Yeah. I mean, aren't you sick of it? No. <laughs> okay. Okay, so fluoride directly inhibits which enzyme? Everybody, NLAs. Okay, well, okay. Put it in. Okay, we'll put it in. Actually, somebody made an impassioned plea that this is one of the most important parts of this exam. Yeah, okay, put cool. Okay, number eight. The total amount of skeletal muscle glycogen is four times greater than liver glycogen. What do you think? That's true. A seven kilogram person has 400 grams of muscle glycogen. 100 grams of liver glycogen, it's more concentrated in the liver, much more concentrated, but the total amount is more in skeletal muscle. Uh, skeletal muscle glycogen cannot be utilized to support plasma glucose. Is that true or false? Very true, very true. So why? Why? What is the... Bingo! S muscle is lacking glucose 6-phosphatase. Very good. Love it. So A is the correct response there. Uh, taking a look at these structures, uh, I already counted the first three up, and there's 18 carbons. That first uh, fatty acid, what would you call that? Would that be uh, saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated? Monounsaturated. Mono what fatty acid is that? That's oleate. So would that be 18 colon what? 18 colon 1. 18 carbons, it has one double bond, so that's an 18 colon 1. Let's look at B, and it's 18 carbons, and it'd be 18 carbons, uh, 18 colon 2, and C is 18 colon 3. So what is the common name for B? Linoleate. And what is C? Linolenate. Okay. And uh, D, I think that's 20, that would be arachidone. So let's look at 9. Which of the similar length fatty acids would have the highest melting temp? Which one? A. You know, the greater the degree of unsaturation, the lower its melting temp. So we're going in just the other direction. A would have the highest melting temp. Uh, which fatty acid is most abundant in olive oil? A. Which represents an omega-6 fatty acid? That would be B. So for the omega counting, <coughs> as far over to the, the right on the page, that's your omega carbon. So you count in for sulfur A, you go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 
That is an N9. And you go to B, you go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That is an N6. So that would be an omega-6 fatty acid. And this other one is an N3. That's an omega-3 fatty acid. Any questions on how to do omega counting and how to do 18 colon 3 parentheses for N equals uh, N dash 3? Everybody kind of okay on that? Okay, two, Pepsi K, Pepsi K. Pepsi K, what's it used in? Glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis. Gluconeogenesis, I agree. So Pepsi K requires biotin as a prosthetic group. What does require biotin? Any carboxylase. You hear carboxylase, you need biotin. Uh, Pepsi K, uh, B, expression is induced by the actions of insulin. No, it's actually the other way. You actually increase the expression with glucagon. C better be right. Uh, it catalyzes a decarboxylation reaction. That's true. What's the reaction for Pepsi K? What's the substrate? Oxaloacetate. What's the product? Phosphoenol pyruvate. So a four carbon oxaloacetate, three carbon phosphoenol pyruvate. Very good. So, the malate aspartate shuttle, that's the mess right here. Okay. The malate aspartate shuttle, shuttle differs from the alpha glycerol phosphate shuttle in that the malate aspartate shuttle uh, produces more ATP for, per NADH. Yes, no? Yeah, it produces three, and the other one only produces two. So, A is correct. It delivers high energy electrons directly to the electron transport chain's Q pool. No, it supplies its electrons to complex one. Yes? Do we need to know each one of the, the names? names? No. No. I saw in some of the tests. Absolutely. And, I, and this year I said, I have since found out that that's not on the concept list, so I don't see any reason to have you go. That would be NADH, NADH uh, oxidoreductase. No. So don't need to guess. The alpha is a glycerol Actually, you know, I would have to be, it actually, the alpha glycerol phosphate shuttle actually brings it into complex two. And then it dumps it, and then that gets dumped into the Q pool. So, I would not be so bold to ever say it goes directly into the Q pool. Maybe another author might, but I nothing. Okay. I yeah. I, so the malate aspartate shuttle activates more proton pumping stations. Yeah, three versus two. So it looks to me like he's the correct response, right? Cool. Everybody on board. Okay. So. 14, the largest depot of energy stored in the body is in the form of a, either not or you don't, triacylglycerol. By far, far and away, far and away. Glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. She asked me, you know, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Right here. And uh, is that you, Claire, that asked what this one was? Yep. I can't remember. Okay, it was. Okay. So, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase catalyzes the rate limiting step for glycolysis. What's, what enzyme is that? Phosphofructokinase. The rate limiting enzyme for uh, Krebs cycle. The isocitrate dehydrogenase. Actually, this is the rate limiting uh, step for the oxidative phase of uh, hexyl monophosphate shunt, but I don't think I told you that, so I wouldn't ask that. Uh, so, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase catalyzes the Right limiting step for glycolysis? No. The conversion of uh, glucose 1-phosphate for glycogen synthesis? No. That is a, a phosphoglucosomerase. Um, the final bypass reaction for gluconeogenesis? <coughs> That's glucose 6-phosphatase. Isn't it? So D better be looking good. 
the first reaction of the hexyl monophosphate shunt oxidative phase. That's true. Okay. 16. Which metabolic pathway or process is most directly inhibited by fluoride? What do you think? Glycolysis. I agree with you. Okay. One or more oxidative decarboxylation reactions. Oxidative decarboxylation. So you're kicking off a CO2 and you're kicking off two high energy electrons, right? Okay. Uh, occur in each of the following except one, which is the exception. Uh, glycolysis. Is there any decarboxylation with glycolysis? No. No. Uh, so A is going to be the correct answer. Krebs cycle, there's actually two of those. Hub reaction, there's one of those. Oxidative decarboxylation. Pentose phosphate pathway, that last one in the oxidative phase is actually an oxidative decarboxylation. We're getting down to a 5-carbon ribulose biophosphate. So A is the only correct answer. Okay, 18, we've already kind of uh, blasted through this. Compared to an 18 colon 3 and 3 fatty acid, an 18 colon 2, and I don't know how else to, 18 2 uh, and omega-6 fatty acid. Um, so this omega-6 fatty acid, uh, hey, A, has a higher melting temp. That's true. It only has two double bonds versus three. Now, nobody's ever going to ask you a 16 with two double bonds and, a, and an, a 20 with three double bonds. Okay. You can't make the comparison. It has to be similar length, something like that. Uh, the omega-6 fatty acid B has a greater degree of unsaturation. It only has two. The other one has three. So no, that's not right. It is more readily synthesized by the body. Ah, tell me the answer to that. That's not a correct answer. Why? Neither of them are synthesized in the body. We, can, we, can't, we can't synthesize a double bond beyond that number nine carbon, right? So, um, so neither of those. That's a hell of a question. Ooh, I must have been a real ass right now. <laughs> okay, activation of pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase. Pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase. We didn't really talk about this, but very, very briefly we will. Uh, that is the hub reaction going from pyruvate to acetyl CoA. This is directly allosterically regulated. Uh, if you have NADH, uh, that's going to inhibit this pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And also acetyl CoA will, this is a form of end product inhibition, will inhibit this reaction. But what really regulates this guy is the phosphorylation status of pyruvate dehydrogenase. Whoops. When you phosphorylate it, when you phosphorylate it, is it more active or less active? It's much less active. So it's almost to the point of say it's inactive. So dephosphorylated is active. Pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase is the enzyme that when it's activated, it phosphorylates this. So activated kinase slows down this reaction. Okay? Let's see what that... And there is uh, a pyruvate dehydrogenase phosphatase that will dephosphorylate it. So it's you don't phosphorylate it, and it's there forever. Um, so, that is question number 19. Activation of pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase. So, activation of the kinase results in the phosphorylation of pyruvate. Doesn't do anything like that. Uh, it decreases acetyl-CoA production. Yeah, that's, that's going to happen. Um, an increased rate of the hub reaction. Well, it would be a decreased rate. Uh, the dephosphorylation of the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. It's actually the phosphorylation of that complex. Any question on that reaction? Okay. Um, 20. 
the complete oxidation of one acetyl-CoA molecule in the TCA cycle um, results in the release of one CO2. Two CO2s, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the synthesis of one new oxaloacetate. A lot of people went through this one. You're just recycling that same oxaloacetate. There's no, you're not synthesizing a new one. You're bringing in two carbons with acetyl-CoA, and guess what? Those two carbons are kicked off in reaction two and reaction three. So you're just left with the same mole carbons. So really what you're left with is it's the electrons, and then you're tearing apart those electrons. Okay, uh, what number are they? Okay, uh, C, the harvesting of three pair of high energy electrons. It's actually four. There's four. Yeah, harvest three NADHs, and that's a pair with the all three, and you're harvesting on FADH2. That's another pair, so there's four. Um, 20 better look good. Production of one ATP equivalent by substrate level phosphorylation. You're generating a GTP, going from succinyl CoA to succinate, right? That's an ATP equivalent. So D is the only thing, right? Glucose 6 phosphatase, the last bypass enzyme or gluconeogenesis. Uh, glucose 6-phosphatase untraps glucose. Yes or no? A lot of heads going up and down. Hey, I agree with that. Uh, glucose 6-phosphatase found in most cells. No. no, it's restricted to the liver and to the kidney. Uh, C is located in the cytosol. The lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. That, that's an easy one to go flying past. Uh, this 22, I didn't talk much about this year. Uh, both and so I'm not going to ask you this question, but both pyruvate carboxylase and pyruvate decarboxylase have been discussed in class. I did show you a slide on this. Pyruvate decarboxylase, it's actually used in yeast and microorganisms for ethanol production. Okay, It causes you to make acetyl acetate but I didn't specifically talk about it this year, so I'm not asking that question. You do need to know that some organisms, some organisms, you know, we, some cells in our body, take pyruvate to lactate. Some take it to acetyl-CoA and then process it on. We humans don't ourselves ferment to ethanol. You might have microorganisms in your body that can, but we don't. We don't. So pyruvate carboxylase, and Taylor, I think you asked about pyruvate carboxylase, yes. He said, so that's just in the mitochondria. That's right, it is. That's right, it is. So pyruvate carboxylase is, A, restricted to the mitochondria. Absolutely. Um, B, utilized for the final step of glycolysis. No, that's pyruvate kinase, pyruvate kinase. Uh, is required for gluconeogenesis from glycerol. I actually made kind of a point. Glycerol, literally 20% of the class, and they were beautiful diagrams. <coughs> Absolutely beautiful. So, you know, I gave people points, but they lost points. And they said, yes, we take these carbons, we come here, we go into the mitochondria, and we <laughs> bypass it here, and, and they wanted every bit of enzymatic machinery to be used, and, and it was gorgeous. It's just that it just goes here. It doesn't go here. You know, the body is pretty darn logical. So A is the only correct response. Which is a sufficient precursor for glucose synthesis? Acetyl-CoA is not. Anything that's me uh, metabolized to acetyl-CoA is not. Fatty acids, which won't break down of fatty acids, will not be part of this exam, but we break down fatty acids by beta oxidation to acetyl-CoA. You already know from previous things that uh, leucine and isoleucine only get broken down to acetoacetate and acetyl-CoA. So, 
Yeah, lysine and isoleucine. Gee whiz. No, I got it wrong again. I got it wrong again. And the answer is right here. Lysine and leucine aren't? Gee whiz. Arginine is the only one that does here? Boy. I wish I could uh, blame that on something, but no. That's just... What's the term? Brain fart? Something like that. 25. Compared to glucokinase, the enzyme hexokinase does not require magnesium. All kinases do. Or a closely related divalent metal cation. Uh, B. Is found, hexokinase is found in far fewer tissues. It's almost in every tissue. It has a lower affinity for glucose. It has a much higher affinity for glucose. So what does that say? The hexokinase has what kind of KM? A much lower KM. That's probably how that question is going to pop up this year. Oh, how about that? You happen to learn something. Okay, uh, hexokinase is regulated more by allosteric control. Well, it's true. Glucose 6-phosphate allosterically controls it. Nothing allosterically controls glucokinase, so these are the only correct answer. Uh, this year we went along with the um, the terminology in this book. Uh, fructose from the diet that is taken up by the liver enters the glycolytic pathway primarily at glycoly glycolysis phase, I would say phase this year. Uh, it's phase two. Uh, fructose, uh, oh boy, I'm glad this one popped up. Fructose that's taken up by the liver goes in primarily at dihydroxyacetone phosphate. That's in phase two glycolysis. Um, uh, lactose, where does that come in at? Glucose 6-phosphate. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. So it's B is the correct response for 26. Uh, 27. 27. Uh, which is the pace generating reaction for glycolysis? You've already told me that. What letter? B. 28. Dehydrogenase enzymes catalyze which of those? Oxidation reduction reactions, right? So hydration, yeah, I'm not even going to go there. So 29, which pairing is incorrect? Glycolysis, does that take place in the cytosol? Yep. HMP shunt, cytosolic? Yep. TCA cycle, mitochondrial? Yep. Uh, glycogenolysis, mitochondria? No, everything to do with glycogen is in the cytosol. Okay. Okay, here we have one of these caselets. So we have a 19-year-old female, she's 5'8", 124 pounds, she weighs less than what she did when, two years ago. Good blood pressure, some numbness, tingling, burning sensations, hands, feet, generalized fatigue. She was diagnosed at age 11 with, what kind of diabetes is that? Type 1, isn't it? Uh, but her glucose was well controlled through her teen years. Uh, she's prescribed one injection of long duration insulin with short duration insulin as needed. She's off to college. So, a uh, patient who has previously reported her complaints to her mother is visiting parents during the semester break from college. Unknown to patient, mother schedules an early morning appointment with patient's longtime physician. During history and physical, physician sees bruises. Bruises occurred six weeks ago. So, poor healing going on here. Patient's fasting plasma glucose is 317. What is normal? Like 80 to 100, right? 70 is still okay, but upon questioning, patient states that she might not be as diligent in monitoring her glucose and injecting her insulin as she has been in the past. Yeah, I can kind of buy that. Given the finding above, over the past month, average plasma glucagon was blank than what it would be typically expected in a healthy person. So would it be lower or higher? Her glucagon is raging because if you don't have insulin, insulin is really what signals alpha cells that if there's glucose or not. And this woman doesn't have any insulin, so her alpha cells think, or A cells think, oh, 
no glucose, so her glucagon is very, very high. And that's stimulating gluconeogenesis. That's making the glycemic control even worse. This patient's weight loss is likely secondary to chronic hypoglycemia. She's not hypoglycemic. The loss of calories via fecal excretion, unlikely. Loss of calories via the urine, very, very likely. That's why she's 17, 13 pounds lighter than what she was two years ago. Okay, according to NIH, when you use uh, hemoglobin A1C percentage, glycation percentage, for diagnosis, normal is 5.7 or below. Pre-diabetes between 5.7 and 6.4. Diabetes is 6.5. Okay. What's the best prediction for this person's percentage? Is it less than normal, approximately normal, or higher? It's definitely higher. There's no doubt about that. And people missed that last year. Don't miss it. So if you don't understand it, come see me. Okay. An elevated hemoglobin A1C percentage typically suggests advanced glycation end product formation has occurred. Okay. Reducing sugars have reacted with and attached to A1C units of hemoglobin. Yeah. Uh, average plasma glucose concentration has been elevated for the previous 90 days. Yes. D is the correct response. If this patient is actually found to be significantly underutilizing her insulin therapy, which statement is our true, is our true, always underlying those automatic qualifiers, I underline true here, uh, which is true regarding her glycogen metabolism enzyme. So, she has too low of insulin, she probably has too high of glucagon, right? So. Her glycogen phosphorylase would be in its A or active form. Now, glycogen phosphorylase goes in its active form when you have low insulin, high glucagon. That's what she has. A's right. She might not have any glycogen, but her phosphorylase is raring to go. It's phosphorylating it's in its A form. Glycogen synthase would be in its active form. Active forms the A form? No, it'd be in its B or inactive form. Uh, it would be phosphorylated. Her glycogen synthase would be phosphorylated. That's inactive. Her, oops, sorry about that. I am very, I, I really, sorry about that. Hey, hi. Yeah, no, I'm just finishing this. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Okay. Somebody's having heart palpitations, thinking that I've been having such inner ear. Normally, uh, you know, there's times that I'm not allowed to drive anymore. I'm not to that point yet. So my wife's thinking that I was inner ear spinning and you know piled into a tree. <laughs> so um, glycogen phosphorylase kinase. Glycogen phosphorylase kinase, that's the enzyme that regulates the phosphorylation of glycogen phosphorylase. Glycogen phosphorylase kinase would be in its defos it'd be in its phosphorylated form. So A is the only thing correct there. Okay, uh, this book illustrates the electron transport chain differently. Uh, and bottom line is you can't do it two-dimensionally and make it look right. Uh, well, you kind of could if you did it on the edge. So, which reaction harvests electrons that enter the electron transport chain at B? So, electrons going into complex 2. So, succinate to fumarate. That generates FADH2, and that does go into complex 2. B, going from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, that generates NADH in the mitochondria. That actually go into A, okay? Pyruvate to oxaloacetate, that's a carboxylation reaction. There's no oxidation reduction, nothing. Uh, Succinyl-CoA to succinate, that is a substrate level phosphorylation. You're generating GTP. Nothing having to do with electron transport, right? Okay, 
36, you can tell a son of a bitch wrote this exam. <laughs> so glucose, that is first trapped by the actions of glucokinase. Where are we? In the liver. Can then be processed and oxidized by glycolysis to yield two pyruvates. Electrons harvested in this pathway enter the electron transport chain at, so what shuttle are we using? Malate aspartate. And where does it deliver? Complex one, which is A, isn't it? Oh, that's a good question. I kind of pat myself on the back for that one. Uh, which electron transport chain complex does not participate, participate in proton pumping? Complex two. E represents, what, what's E? So, so what does oh. complex 2 use? If it goes in complex 2, or how does complex 2 get anything relevant? Or what does it do? Does it use like complex 3 or complex 4 or something? So, if let's say we generate FADH2 in the Krebs cycle, the electrons will run more than complex 2 first. They will still pass in complex 2, they will still pass in complex 4. So it's going to activate bonds and pumping structures, right? 3 and 4, exactly. But if they come in via complex 1, they're going to activate pumping station 1, 3, and 4. Okay, so E represents oxygen. So 39, we'll go through these really quick. The hub reaction is regulated by allosteric control, covalent modification, uh, which is A and C. And suicide inhibition, that's a wall thing, and I don't get into walls territory. <laughs> uh, four, uh, 40, converting glucose 6-phosphate to ribulose 5-phosphate, boom, boom, uh, yields 1 NADH, no, 2 NADH is no, 1 NADPH, no, 2 NADPH is yes, D is correct. Thiamine deficiency, thiamine, uh -huh. would directly impact which reaction? Going from succinate to fumarate, uh, that utilizes FAD, FAD, you need riboflavin. We didn't hear anything about the enzyme itself <laughs> requirement, so I'm not happy with A. Are you? Pyruvate to oxaloacetate, going from a three carbon molecule to a four carbon molecule. That's a carboxylation reaction, that's pyruvate carboxylase. That's biotin, isn't it? Yeah. C, going from alpha ketoglutarate to succinyl CoA, that is alpha keto alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. That is thiamine, lipoic acid, riboflavin, niacin. Uh, yeah, C would definitely be impacted by thiamine deficiency. D, glyceraldehyde to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Uh, that is an oxidation reaction. And you're going to use NAD plus to accept electrons. That comes from niacin. So the only correct response there is uh, C. Um, okay, 42, glucose 6-phosphatase activity. Uh, already seen something on this. Is in the cytosol of liver cells. It's in the ER of liver cells. In the mitochondria of heart cells? No, it's not in heart cells at all. In the endoplasmic reticulum of kidney cells? Yes, it is. She's correct. A lipoic acid derivative is utilized by the enzyme that catalyzes what reaction? The only thing where I talked about lipoic acid is the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction and the alpha keto, uh, alpha keto glutarate dehydrogenase reaction. So, B is right. That's the only thing that's right. It could say alpha ketoglutarate to succinyl CoA. That would have been a correct response, too. Almost two hours. You guys are tough.
Okay. So, questions, questions. I'm going to stick around for a while to generally ask questions. And ask what answer questions. I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask anything other than that. Uh, two different shuttles. Yes. So the malate, the Maha one, happen only in liver, and then the liver and cardiac muscle. So MOGCA, the malate aspartate shuttle, is in liver and cardiac muscle. Okay. And then the other one is in everywhere else. It's in most places, but the place where I really want you to know it is skeletal muscle. Okay. Yep. And there are other electron shuttles. We're not going to worry about it. I'm not worried about it. Wave your hand. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you're right here. What's the other shuttle called? Yes, it has two names, the alpha glycerol phosphate shuttle, or it's also called the glycerol 3 phosphate shuttle. So that's, yeah, I wish I could remember the pages of the book that I wrote. Yeah, it's in the red book. Yeah, take this home and semester break and tell your loved ones. This was one one meeting.